Good morning. A few announcements before we begin. Uh, let's see. Uh, Harlan Nepson died on Wednesday. His funeral will be tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And there will be visitation at the Painesville Funeral Home, and that will be from 5 to 7 tonight. Next Sunday, we have the group God Gave the Song coming, and they will be presenting this service for us. So we are looking forward to them. There's an announcement in here for the community-wide vacation Bible service, vacation Bible school, excuse me. So, and of course, the ice cream social is coming up quickly. So, are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? I don't see any hands, so let us begin our service by turning to hymn number 412 in the green hymnal, Sing to the Lord of Harvest, 412. Would you rise, please? Sing to the Lord. Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example to the point of the, and point us to the path of obedience, and give us strength to follow his commands. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. First lesson this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. And you can find it on page 576 in your pew Bibles. A man came from Baal Shalishah, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. 
And our second lesson is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, on page 1820 of your Pew Bible. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of this glorious riches, out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. And we are on page 1655, beginning with verse 1. 1655 and verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of the Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked him this only to test him, for Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not be enough, would not buy enough bread for each one to have even a bite. The other, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that, that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew himself again to the mountain. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, "'It is I. Don't be afraid.'" Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were headed. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Some kids were asked to draw a picture of their favorite Bible story. One student drew a picture of a riverbank. It was a lazy summer day, the river rolling along slowly, a butterfly floating ever, on an ever-so-slight breeze in the upper left-hand corner. Under a huge, shady oak tree, there sits a boy. Well, he's half-sitting, half-lying down with his back against the tree. 
There is a fishing pole in his hands, a straw hat pulled down over his eyes, and a long blade of grass in his teeth. The teacher sighs and says, What Bible story is this? And the kid replies, Oh, that's the story of the boy who loafs and fishes. <laughs> Sorry, that's not what it is. It is the boy who had the loaves and the fishes. That was the lesson we just read. And this story ends with people in awe of Jesus at the marvelous signs that he has performed. Even before the miracle, they are in awe of him and the healings that he has done for the people that they brought to him. And now we add this on top of it, and the people are ready to make Jesus their king by election, if possible, and by force, if necessary. A few verses later, John will elaborate on this idea. He says, So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got themselves into the boat and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, how did you get here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you look for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Aha. The miracle has been done. The people have been fed. And what do they want? They want more bread. They want another meal. They are thinking to themselves, what a king this Jesus would make. We would never have to be hungry again. You have to realize and give them a little bit of a break because due to heavy taxation from the religious leaders and the Romans, most people went to bed hungry at least once a month and maybe more than that. The taxes were so heavy. And so they see in Jesus the opportunity to have food. And I'm sure perhaps they thought beyond that and said, we will never have to work again. No more plowing, no more planting, no more weeding, no more harvesting. Just alakazam, alakazoom, and poof, instant bread. You don't even have to add water. And if we get tired of bread, well, he could always do that thing with the fish. A little variety evening, even. He could do fish wieners, fish bologna, fish salami, and maybe even fish turkey. Why, I'll bet with a little practice, he could do two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. They wanted Jesus to be king, not because he was the Messiah, not because he was the Savior, not because he was the way, the truth, and the life, not because he is the only rightful king of our hearts, but because of the bread. On the mission field in the 19th century, the great century of mission, they had something called rice Christians. These were people who came to the mission. They would profess to believe in Jesus. They would sing the hymns and pray the prayers and do all the Christian things. How come? Because in doing so, they would often land themselves a job at the mission, maybe sweeping up after the services, doing the dishes, weeding the garden, whatever. And this job would pay them room and board. They would get a room, a bed, and all the rice they needed. Well, who knows? Maybe they did believe in Jesus. Maybe they had, in fact, been converted. But they were definitely there for the rice, for the job, for the room, for the rice. And that's why they were called rice Christians. 
Well, perhaps in Jesus' day, they were called bread Christians. But both of these stories illustrate the same thing. In Jesus, oh, excuse me, people were sometimes drawn to Jesus, not because he was the Messiah, not because there is no place else to go that he has the words of eternal life, but because of the bread or because of the rice or what they represent, because of what they can get out of Jesus. Why do we follow Jesus? I could make a scale, I suppose. And on the one end would be we follow Jesus for what we can get out of him. That could be daily bread and butter and hopefully steak and lobster at least sometimes. In the drama, <coughs> excuse me, in the drama games Christians play, one of the actors boldly states, of course I go to church. I got to be seen in church. It's good for business. And another actor replies, of course I go to church. It gives me a chance to strut my stuff when I sing in the choir. And a third one chimes in, of course I go to church. I wouldn't dare not to. Monday's my poker night. This is a case of people following Jesus for what they can out of him. And this end of the scale perhaps is best summed up by the words of the song, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all have Porsches. I need to make amends. People following Jesus for the perks. On the other end of the scale are those who follow Jesus and who follow him not because of what they can get out of him, but because he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. They follow him because there is nothing else in the entire universe that is more important than serving Jesus and loving him. As Jesus puts it, they see beyond the bread, they see beyond the fish, they see beyond their own stomachs, and they see the sign. The miraculous sign that is performed to show that Jesus has come in the flesh as God and is there for us for our salvation. And if that is in fact who he is, then we need to follow him no matter where he leads. And we go where he sends us, and we do what he wants done, not because of the rewards he has promised, but because he is the one, because he is the Lord. There is a very moving illustration of this in the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and no fruit be on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will, re I will exult in the God of my salvation. Okay, let's see. No figs, no fruit, no olives, no grain, no sheep, no cattle. But still says Habakkuk, I will rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because he is the Lord. I guess you could say this is faith at its finest. This is devotion at its most pure. That's the high end of the scale. So there are two ends. Those that follow Jesus for what they can get from him. Those who follow Jesus because of who he is. All of us fall somewhere on that scale. Nobody follows Jesus entirely for selfish motives. At least nobody follows the, him for selfish motives for very long. I had a friend in college. He was in my communications class. And he wanted to be a pastor. He wanted to be a pastor because pastors get a lot of free stuff. And people are always giving them things. Well, when I got to seminary, I looked around and I didn't see him. So nobody follows Jesus 
for the free stuff, for selfish motives, not for very long. But we have to remember that we are humans, and just about everything that human beings do has mixed motives. And so it's not surprising that our motives are mixed when we follow Jesus. We'd like to think that we would follow Jesus no matter what, through thick and thin, but we're kind of hoping for thick. We don't want to treat Jesus like a meal ticket, but we are grateful for all of the material blessings He has given us. We fall on the scale someplace. The important thing, however, is not where we fall on the scale, but which direction we are moving. Ideally, we should be moving away from follow, following Jesus for what we can get out of Him, and we should be moving toward following Jesus because He is the only one worth following, the only one who is worth living our lives for. Our motives for following Jesus are not the important thing. The important thing is that we allow God to work in our hearts and to change those motives from what's in it for me to how can I serve my Lord. One more story. The teacher asks the class to draw a picture of their favorite Bible story. One picture was labeled the fiery furnace. You know the story where Nebuchadnezzar had people thrown into the fiery furnace if they wouldn't bow down to him. One well, particular picture, we have the furnace. We have the flames, and in the flames were three men and a small animal. And the teacher thought, small animal? What's with that? So she asked the little girl, would you explain your picture, please? Oh, she said, this one is the angel that protected the men. And the others are Shadrach, Meshach, and a billy goat. <laughs> well, the last one actually was named Abednego. And as far as I know, he was not a goat. Although I see where a child might get confused with that. After all, his name sounds like a video game or a ride at Valley Fair. Let's go ride the Abednego. <laughs> what is worth noting in this story, though, is not the goat or the names of the people or even the appearance of the angel. Rather, what is noteworthy is the conversation between Nebuchadnezzar and these men before they're tossed into the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar threatens them. Now he says, if you are ready to fall down and worship the statue that I made, we'll be cool. No problem. But if you do not worship, you will be immediately thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. And what God will be able to deliver you out of my hands? <laughs> so, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to answer you in regard to this matter. Know this, if the God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O King, well, that'd be great. But if he's not going to deliver us out of your hand, if we are thrown in there and we are burned to the crisp, a crisp, and if we know that's going to happen, O oh, king, we're still not going to serve your gods. We're not going to worship your golden statue. We are only going to worship God. What are they saying? God can deliver us, of course. And if he will, groovy. But if not, so what? You see, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't follow God for what we can get out of him. We follow him because he is the one true God. And we should follow Jesus not because he can give us bread, not because he can give us rice, not because of anything he may be able to give us, but we should follow him because he is Jesus Christ the Lord. There are two ends of the scale, 
following Jesus for what I can get out of him on one end and following Jesus because he is Jesus our Lord. Let us make it our goal to move away from asking what's in it for me and moving toward how can I serve him. Let's pray. Lord, the fact of the matter is, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, you have still given us so much. God has given us all of creation to care for us. You have given us forgiveness and life. You are the Lord. Help us, Lord, work on our motives, that we follow you not for some reason of getting something, but because you are the Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Our hymn is number 423, Lord Whose Love in Humble Service, number 423. Please rise and turn either to the screens or to the back of your bulletin as we join together in our response to the Word. In Christ you have heard the Word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. The holy Keep yourselves in the love of God. 
If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. To the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God grant us pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all our sins. Amen. Sisters and brothers, rejoice. Mend your ways. Encourage one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share with one another the peace of the Lord. Peace be with you. <laughs> no problem. Any, any service you walk away from is a good one. <laughs> Where's your boot? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. God's peace. Peace be with you. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. Please be seated. You're already seated. <laughs> You're ahead of me. Okay. Gracious God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, you call us from death to life, from silence to speech, from idleness to action. With these gifts, we offer ourselves to you. And with the church through all the ages, we give thanks for your saving love. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we pray for your church that we may stand ready, as you will, to carry out and accomplish these very prayers that we say. Lord, in your mercy, we pray that your word would spread everywhere and that people would receive it with gladness, knowing how much you loved them and how you showed that love in sending us your Son, Jesus our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who bear the responsibility of government in all nations everywhere, that they may build upon the solid rock of truth, justice, and mercy, and not upon the sands of self-pride, and self-interest. Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray that your words, Lord, may become our deepest joy and may move us to deeds that reflect the love that you have shown for us. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for people in the human community who cry out because of injustice, oppression, illness, or isolation. We pray that you may hear them as the cry of Jesus himself, suffering in his brothers and sisters. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those that we know, friends, family, relatives, as well as those who are in our congregation and in our community who have special need of your care. We pray that you would bring your healing to Terry Porter, to Bill Ryan, to Jan Peterson, to Ruth Everson, and to Ruth's grandson, David Hansen, who is experiencing abdominal pain. Bring to them your healing, your comfort, and your care. Use us to help them too. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the families of those who have died, especially for the family of Harlan Nepson and the family of Dorothy Hislop. That help us that we may support them with our love. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Del Chesnus, that you would also bring healing to him. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, please receive and answer these things that we ask according to your will. Give us the grace to welcome your word, who is Jesus, that we may live grounded on the rock of your love and mercy, now and all our days. This we ask through Christ our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be <coughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is in the green hymnal, number 260, 260, On Our Way Rejoicing.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord.